Why don't you turn around and give someone a high five, say hello, good morning, welcome them in. Uh, all right, you can take a seat for a minute. Well, I just want to welcome you here. My name is Sean. It's a privilege to be one of the pastors here. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Um, we're going to continue to worship in just a moment. We're going to continue to worship through song. We like to make a big joyful noise here. Uh, you know, singing is one of the weird things we do as Christians. I don't know. You know, there's not many places in the world where you gather and then sing songs together. Uh, but that's what we do here. And uh, here's the cool thing, though. The, the Bible encourages us to make a joyful noise. So you don't even have to sing well. You just got to make a noise. That's why we have Makoto and the team. They're going to sing well. And we're just going to join in them, uh, you know, with a with the loud noise. So uh, we're going we're to worship through song. We're going to worship through giving. We're going to worship through God's word. And uh, all of this, um, the time that we spend together is an act of worship unto the Lord. So my prayer and our prayer has been that through all of this that you would encounter God in a way that perhaps you, you have not uh, this week and that you would, uh, your soul would be refreshed, you'd be restored and encouraged to continue uh, to be the person that God has created you to be. So um, we have some announcements that we're going to roll in a minute. Uh, Nicole Marburger is going to share a little bit about what's happening with One Love Skate so you can roll that video. All right, my name is Nicole Marburger, and my husband Joshua and I are missionaries with One Love Skate, where we purpose to be a positive presence in the skate community. Everybody point up, saying, know the love. <laughs> point at two people, makes them awesome. Eye contact. Show the love. Again, know the love. Show the love. Yeah, that's what our One Love logo means. And I wanted to come up here and personally thank you, Waipuna Chapel, for partnering with us to bring down pro skater Tim Byrne to do three events here on Maui to share with the kids about how he knows the love, the love of Jesus, and how he shows it through something he loves, something he's great at, and that's skateboarding. So in 2020, we brought him down and we went to Kamehameha School. We did an event here at Waipuna Chapel. So here's a picture. Um, he <laughs> he's a pro skater, so he gets this on this platform and he does his thing. It's pretty amazing. I mean, like, of all the times I've watched him, it's not that I was, like, waiting for him to mess up, but, you know, you're just like, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? No. He is a pro. It's really fun to watch, really inspirational, and once he has the kids in rapt attention, he talks to them about how Jesus' love changed his life. It's a trip. So, Waipuna is partnering with us this year to bring him down again, and we are going to be at Kamehameha School again. We have K through 8th grade, and we're hoping the high schoolers will join us too, so join us in prayer about that. And then on Friday, we'll be at King K Kaulike High School. We're going to do lunch Ooh. in the quad, yeah, and then on Saturday, Lord willing, weather permitting, we'll be right back here in our amphitheater at our very own Waipuda Chapel. So if you could join us in prayer for that, we have... Flyers, just like this. These are called bring invitations. Can you say bring invitations? It's a bring invitation. Grab a couple, pass them out. On the back, there is a QR code because at each of our events, we are doing, you can go ahead and use your camera right now if you want and get yourself signed up because we are raffling some fun things at these three events. Um, one of them may or may not be PS5s. So just saying, you need to be there. You need to check out this square, this QR code and join us for that. So with that, I just wanted to say again, thank you for the way that you at Waipuna Chapel love God and love others. We're stoked to do that together this year. So please go grab some of these. Come, come be a part, come be inspired and share, share this opportunity with your friends, neighbors, family, coworkers, etc. Thank you, Waipuna Chapel. When it comes to love, I know this world is vacant. Am I the only one who ain't got time for waiting? So much going on, we need to make some changes. Set this world up for newer generations. This is that one love, one buzz, call for the Henderson. Nation under God, but there are lines that keep us suffering. Background the melanin, wait, faith, intelligence. You live in blind if you can't see this world is desperate. Let's remove the elephant to leave my room for delegates. Standing hand in hand with soldiers, how is that? The deficit, jealousy, yep, a big offense, yet to reap a benefit. Who gon' be that difference in a testament? Can we just put aside our indifference? We can do more than separate. There is so much more to existence. I think we missed it. We know we need is one. Hello, 
Waipuna Puna Chapel. These are the announcements for this week. Finally, Operation Christmas Child is an amazing program by Samaritan's Purse that delivers Christmas gifts to third world children around the world along with the gospel. This year, there are three methods to make and deliver a shoe box. First, you can build a box online at samaritanpurse.org slash Operation Christmas Child. Second, you can donate materials for boxes and then drop them off at Waipuna Chapel for our boxing party on Friday, November 18th at 7 p.m. during our youth group meeting. Third, you can make your own box and drop them off at Grace Bible Church in Kahului between November 14th and 21st. Call the church office to find out drop-off times. If you have any more questions, you can look to the bulletin or contact Tim at waipunachapel.com. That's the last announcement. <laughs> Good morning, Waipuna Chapel. How are we this morning? <laughs> like two of you had coffee. <laughs> My name's Okoto, and it is our privilege to be worshiping with you. Would you stand with us? Let's make a joyful noise to the Lord this morning. <laughs>
morning, Lord. We love you. All this is for you, Jesus. We make our joyful noise even if it's not in key. Hallelujah. <laughs> darkness falls, it won't prevail, cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph, oh my God will never fail, oh my God will never fail, cause I'm gonna see a victory, come on, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle. See you. 
Fill our hearts with your love. 
evidence of your spirit who is not only in our midst but indwells us. We thank you for your goodness and how you expressed yourself in the Old Testament as a God abounding in loving kindness to those that love you. Pray that you would increase our love for you, our, our commitment to you. Pray that you would open our, our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning, Lord, that we would be attentive to your word and that we would acknowledge you with our hearts, with our thoughts, with our entire being, as you are worthy to be praised. Our great, marvelous, wonderful God, our victor and our champion, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Aloha, good morning, Waipuna Chapel. My name is Angie Corpus. I'm on staff here uh, as the First Impressions Coordinator. Uh, in a minute, we have an opportunity to worship through giving, and, um, and I'm going to pray for the offering. We want to thank all of you that give generously uh, online using the Church Center app or the envelopes and the collection boxes. We appreciate your uh, generosity and your faithfulness in giving. You are participating in something that is making an uh, eternal difference in your community. A scripture that comes to mind uh, uh, for our offering is Matthew 6, 21. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Giving uh, can teach us to put God first. Uh, giving, personally for me, is a tangible way to mahalo God. Mahalo God for his generous provisions in my life. There's the physical provisions of my home and my car and my health and my finances. There's the relational provisions. He's blessed me with such wonderful, beautiful people in my life that enrich it so much. And ultimately, it's a way to mahalo him for his sacrificial outpouring of his love, like we just sang about, um, and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. So as you prepare to give either now or later online or however you choose, um, check your heart, check your motivation. Is it out of guilt or obligation? Or is it out of a, a grateful heart and just you want to give a portion back of what really is his anyway? Everything is his. So let's pray for that offering. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can always trust in you. You are an abundant God, and out of your great mercy, you have given us so much. We give you this offering today. With it, we worship you and give our whole selves to you. Please take it and use it for your kingdom and your glory. Extend and multiply its reach and influence, we pray. May it be a great blessing to many. We ask all this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Hey, well, happy Veterans Day weekend. Hey, are there any veterans in the house? If you are, would you do me a favor? Lou, would you stand? I know you're a veteran. Are there any others? Yeah, awesome. Hey, we just want to honor you guys for your service. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. God bless you guys. Thanks so much, man. Awesome.
Awesome. Hey, if you missed the first introduction, my name is Sean. It's a privilege to be one of the pastors on staff here. If you are joining us for the first time, welcome. We're glad that you are here. Uh, we are still in uh, the book of First John, or the letter, rather, of First John. Uh, it's a series we're calling True. Um, if you've missed any of these previous me messages, I encourage you to, you can check them out at, on our YouTube channel um, at White Pinner Chapel, and all those messages are archived there so you can binge watch to your heart's delight. Uh, so uh, throughout this series, uh, John has really kind of been making a defense of truth. Uh, that, that's kind of why we call this series True, because in a world, um, in John's world, as in our world, truth was a kind of moving target, and John was uh, really wanted to ensure that uh, the, the people of God understood what was true, particularly what was true about God, what was true about the person of Jesus Christ, and what was true about them as Christians, what is true about you and I as Christians. And so uh, John, John told us um, last week, if you, if you recall, he kind of stops in the middle of this argument. He's been kind of uh, making this pretty... pretty uh, aggressive argument. His language is pretty stark, and he draws uh, very uh, clear lines. But in the midst of that argument, he kind of just stops, and he says, okay, just, just wait a minute. Just slow down. I just want all of you who are uh, Christians, because he's writing to Christians, and I, I, you know, I always uh, anticipate there are people in the congregation right now or uh, who come in on any given uh, weekend service that are not Christians. You're just curious about faith. You're seeking. You've got some questions. Know that we're really glad that you are here. But John was really clear about who his audience was. He was writing to Christians. And in the midst of this kind of argument that he's making, defending truth, he just stops and he says, hey, just, just stop for a minute and behold Behold, just, just stop and gaze upon the incredible love of God, the great love of God. And he says, the kind of love, the quality of love that God has lavished upon us. So that, so that, right? This is a cause because God has loved us. We can become uh, children of God. And John says, this is who you are. So writing to Christians, he says, man, you guys are loved by God. And, and, and because of God's great love, he gave and in the gift of his son, right, we get the right to believe, as those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, to become children of God. And, and so John just wants us to stop and remind us of who we are. Because this has been the foundation of his argument. He's saying, if you are a Christian, right, if you are a follower uh, uh, of Jesus Christ, if you are indeed a child of God, then your life is going to look different. Like some, you know why it's going to look different? It's not because you're different. It's not because you're particularly deserving or moral or, or a good person. The reason your life is going to look different is because God has done something in your life, right? There's something in your life that apart from God, you just cannot explain. God has done something in your life. Um, the, the language of Scripture is, um, is interesting. It, it talks about it. Uh, in terms of, of rebirth or being born again. Um, and, and so th this is how Peter describes it. The Apostle Peter says, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Right? So according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So God has done something. He has caused you to be born again. He's given you new life in Christ. And, and so what makes you a, a, a Christian it's not because you're a good person, you're smarter than anyone else. It's, it's because God has done something in your life. Uh, God has caused you to be born again. And that new birth, that, 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 that born again experience, uh, theologians have a big word for it. It's called regeneration. Say regeneration. regeneration. All right. You can drop that in your Bible study. People think you're smart, right? Regeneration. And it simply means to be born or reborn or renewed. And, and so this is directly from Scripture. Paul, writing to Titus, he says this. He, God, saved us. So who saved us? God. Who found you? God. You didn't find God. God found you, right? God, God found you. He took you. He redeemed you. He saved you. He caused you to be born again. Saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness. In other words, you were undeserving. I was undeserving, Right? There's nothing good intrinsically about me. God is good. Right? And, and, but according to his own mercy, by washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, right, you were born again. God did something in your life, and that's what makes you different as a Christian. So just as your, your physical birth uh, resulted in, in a physical birth, your spiritual rebirth kind of uh, results in a, a new birth in, into the heavenly realms, as it were, right? And so through the new birth, right, uh, we begin to see God and hear God and experience God differently. 
because the Spirit of God is indwelling us, revealing and showing and leading. And, and so th this is kind of what makes you and I different as Christians, not because we're intrinsically different in and of our own righteousness, but because God has done something in us. And, and kind of this has been uh, John's argument throughout this, this whole letter. He says, because you are different, because you're born again, because you're a child of God, because you're a Christian, your life is going to look different. You're going to act different, think different, behave differently because you've been born again. And the cool thing is, like, the fact that God has done something in us and kind of given us the, the indwelling presence of his spirit that is kind of now leading us and directing us and actually giving us the power to live a life that's pleasing him, that's amazing, right? It gets better than that. The scripture says that God not only transforms us, but he transfers us. He moves us from one realm to the next. From the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his glorious son. From spiritual death to spiritual life. There's a transference that happens. You were once dead in your trespasses, now you're alive in Christ. So, so God had not only transforms us internally, moment by moment, bit by bit, as we're walking with Jesus, as we're spending time with Jesus, but he's actually transferred us. Positionally, he has changed your position. You, where once you, you were a child of wrath, now you're a child of God. Right? And so God has done something in us. And because he has done something in us, right, uh, we ought to look different. Right? John, John puts it in this way. He says we ought to walk in the light as he is in the light. That we ought to uh, purify ourselves as he is pure. We ought to have the ability to discern error from, 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 um, from truth. We should be able to discern right from wrong, good from evil. Because the spirit of truth is living in us and leading us and guiding us. And Jesus kind of has, gives us the same kind of picture. He, he talks about life being, being such as a tree. And, and Jesus says, you know what kind of tree it is by the fruit that it bears. And so he says it this way uh, in Matthew's gospel. He says, a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. And this has been John's argument, right? If you truly are a Christian, your life's going to look different. And you're going to bear the fruit of the Spirit. You're going to bear the fruit of God. Peace, joy, gentleness. And John's purpose in writing this is that your joy quotient can be complete. That all those things that, 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 that come from living a life in the Spirit, peace and contentment and all those things are, are what causes joy to rise up in our hearts. And, so, and so, so, so John is saying, man, because you are born of God, because you've been born again, your life ought to look different. God has done something in your life. God has done something in my life. And so John would kind of make this case in, in, in chapter 3, verse 9. He says, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. In other words, if you're born again, you're not going to just continue in, that, in, in wicked pursuits. You're not going to pursue, pursue pleasure and self and, and, and kind of those ungodly things in your life. You, you cannot make a practice of sinning if you are, in fact, born of God. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, sinning because he is born of God. And, and, and so... What we get to see, I don't know, maybe you've noticed this as you've been, we've been reading through this uh, letter. And John, re, reading John's letter is kind of like ascending a spiral staircase. Like, he keeps circling back to these big themes. As, but each time he comes back to these themes of obedience, of truth, of love, he just presses us a little deeper and deeper and deeper. And so now as we, as we come to the end of chapter 3, he's going to press us deeper into this idea of loving people and what that actually looks like. And so in chapter 2, he, brings us, he brought it up for the first time. He says uh, in, in verse 10, Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. And then in chapter, uh, verse 10 of chapter 3, he kind of frames it in the negative. He says, whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So he's saying, if you, if you abide in God, you're going to love your brother. And, and if you don't love your brother, you don't abide in God. So, so he kind of uses love as an evidence of the Christian life, that we have in fact been born again. And now John is going to press us a little deeper in verse 11. He goes on, he said, this is what he says. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures, you can open up to 1 John chapter 3. We'll pick up the story in verse 11. So this is what he says. He says, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Like, you've heard this message from the beginning. If you're a Christian, you have, this is not the first time you've heard about loving people. Amen? Raise your hands if you've heard it before, right? I mean, this is the, this is the deal, right? The center, at the very center of the Christian message is this idea to love. And that's rooted in, John would say, in John 3.16. Who, who has, remembers or could recite John 
Recite it with me. When you count to three, here we go. One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know that verse, right? Christians, we know it. It's, it's one of the most well-known verses. Probably, even if you're not a Christian, you've heard that verse. How many of you know what verse 17 is? Who knows the verse 70? This is what it says. For God did not send his son Jesus. This is right after that, right? You've got to read your Bible, not just a part of it, all of it, right? It's for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is the love of God, right? God's love is not a condemning love. God's love is a redeeming love, a saving love, right? And, and, and so this is at the center of the Christian message. And John says, you know, you've heard this from the beginning, to, to his readers, to, to the, those who, the audience he was writing to. He says, this is at the center of what it means to be a Christian. And so your salvation, my salvation, is rooted in the love of God that is demonstrated by the sacrificial giving of his son, Jesus Christ. And so as a Christian, if you've been a partaker in this transforming love of God, if you've been a beneficiary of, of Jesus' sacrifice, for your redemption and your salvation, right? John is saying your only reasonable response is to love God in return. And the way you love God is by loving the people he loves. And who does God love? We just said it. The world, right? The world, right? Now, we've talked about the world before. John talks about the world in two different ways here. One is the cosmos, right? Which is more about the systems of the world and the values of the world. But when, when, it, when John says God so loved the world, he's talking about the creation. God created this world, and God loves his creation. God created you, whether you acknowledge him or not, and he loves you, right? And so we're called to love that which God loves, right? Including the people of the world. And so John's going to press us down, saying that love, the quality of love that, that God wants for us to express to the world, right, has to begin in the family of God. Right? It has to begin here. Um, and so um, what he's going to do, he's going he's to take an example, an Old Testament example of Cain and love, and, and, and show us how hate and animosity can exist within the family of God. And so here's, this is what he says. This is his argument. In verse uh, 12, he, goes, he says this. We should not be like Cain. Say Cain. All right? We don't want to be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother, and why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Now, the story of Cain and Abel are, is found in Genesis uh, chapter 4. They were the uh, two sons of uh, Adam and Eve. And um, John's interpretation of the Genesis text is far more explicit than the actual text itself. Uh, Abel, uh, we're, we're told, was a, she uh, was a shepherd. He, he raised goats, sheep, wh whatever shepherds do. He took care of those things. And Cain was a farmer. And they brought a sacrifice of worship to God. Um, this is actually the first recorded uh, act of worship in the Scriptures. Is Cain and Abel bringing a sacrifice of worship to God. And we're told uh, in, in the text that um, Abel brought the best of his flock. Right? The firstborn. So he brought the first and the best. While Cain, on the other hand, just brought the excess of the produce of the ground. And so because Cain, Abel, brought the, the, the very first and the best, his offering was received by God. But simply because Cain brought just his excess, God rejected that offering because it wasn't his first and his best. And so Cain's response to the Lord's correction was anger. Anger not directed at God, but directed towards his brother Abel. And so God warns Cain. He says this in Genesis 4. He says, if you do well, say do well, right? In other words, if you live righteously, right? If you do well, you will, will you not be accepted? It's a, it's a good question. And the question, the answer to that is yes, of course you will, right? If you do not do well, he says, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. And so John picks up kind of on this contrast of, of Cain's unrighteous uh, action, and Abel's righteous action. And he argues, if you do well like Abel, uh, if you practice righteousness, you'll be a child of God. But if you, and you will rule over sin. That's the positive sense. However, if you are like Cain, you do not well, you practice unrighteousness, it's evidence that you are a child of the devil, of the evil one. And sin will rule over you. That's John's argument. And it's interesting that 
that John never mentions, in, in his argument here, he doesn't mention Abel by name. He simply says it's Cain's brother. Because he's talking about the context of brotherly love. Which is interesting, because John's point is actually really disturbing, if you think about it. Um, you know, John, John's point, um, he actually made this point earlier. He's just circling back and pressing us a little deeper into this point. And here's his point. It's possible to be in the family of God, but not be of the family of God. He said that again. It's possible to be in the family of God, in church, you know, doing all the things, because Cain was and Abel were the same family, biologically the same family. They both participated in an act of worship to God. Both were in the family, but only one of them was of the family. And that's a kind of a disturbing point to think about, right? Um, Abel was a child of God, according to John. Um, Cain, John says, was of the evil one. And it was evidence of his family allegiance by his practice. Cain was jealous of his brother. That jealousy led to hatred. That hatred led to murder. And, and, and so John is, is using Cain and Abel not as, only as an example, but as a type. And so John continues. He says, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. So John's assessment is really stark. I mean, this is what John is saying. It's, it's, it's pretty, pretty stark. He's saying, if you are in the world, right, if you, if you have bought into the values of the world, whatever those might be, kind of possession, kind of finding your identity in possession, in status and power and pleasure, comfort, whatever those things are that the world kind of promotes as the success of this life. If your values are rooted in those things, John's assessment is that you are of the evil one, like Cain. And so it's really clear um, that, that, that John just, it just makes this, this, this comparison with, with Cain and Abel, how Cain uh, hated Abel. John says, in the same way, those who are in the world who have rooted their values in the values of the world will hate you as a Christian. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've struggled with this all my Christian life. I tell you why, because I think there's, there's an intrinsic part, certainly of me, I think, but I think it's true of all people. Uh, every human being wants to be loved and accepted. Now, if you really think about that, now, I don't think about this text very often. I thought about it this week because I was sitting in it. I was like, man, to think about the world hates me. I'm like, that doesn't make me feel real comfortable, right? You know, to think about two-thirds of the world population <laughs> hates you, right? I want to be loved. I want to be liked. I want to be accepted. And there's a vast majority of people that because I am a Christian will not love me, will not accept me. I mean, that's a stark reality, right? Um, again, I don't think about this very often, but this week I did. And God was so good. He's so gracious. So I met with a bu bunch of friends uh, this, this week for, for breakfast. And, and one, of, uh, one of my really good friends here on Maui, he's, um, he uh, shared a story. Uh, there's something that he had experienced recently. Um, he has uh, a pretty large family. His oldest daughter just went off to college. And uh, she was dating someone throughout high school. They were kind of really in love. It seemed like it was going really well. Uh, but she went off to college. He went off somewhere else. I don't know where he went. Um, he didn't say. Um, but about two months into the college experience, he broke up with her. And she was devastated because she really loved him. She really cared about them. They kind of th had talked about maybe marriage. And it was like it's one of those really uh, you know, deep romantical kind of connections they had. Um, and what made it worse that you know, a couple weeks later, he ends up you know, dating another girl. So that was just kind of like salt to the wound. And, and she was devastated. Uh, she was just kind of spinning out. Um, and my friend told me that she, she just stayed at home and, and watched anime um, all day. I'm like, wow, that's how millennials deal with depression? Like me personally, I'm in a dark room, like watching cage fighting, drinking Jack Daniels. I, that's no. <laughs> but that, I mean, it's just like a different world. I don't know. Anime because you're depressed, right? So, okay. Uh, so anyway... So, so she, a couple of her roommates, one weekend, they, they go off um, to, to a, a weekend retreat up in the mountains, and it's just beautiful up there. Uh, it's, a, it's a cabin right on a lake, and it's uh, this just beautiful, spectacular environment. 
And she said she had a, she told her dad that she had a moment of just encounter that she's never experienced with God before. She was just sitting one morning, sitting at the lake, and the sun was kind of rising up, and the, and the, the lake and the snow-capped mountains were being reflected, and she was just overwhelmed in the creation of God, at His majesty and His power and His magnificent. And it was like for the first time, like all the dots connected for her, that this God of all this creation loved her and had called her by name. And, and she had this epiphany. Suddenly she was like, like she compared the love of God and all his power and all his majesty with the kind of minuscule little love of this boy that she was pining over. And it just seemed so insignificant. And she was like, whatever. And like in a moment, she like got over it. It was just like in comparison to the love of God, it just seemed so minuscule and insignificant. The love of this boy or this unrequited love of this boy just seemed so minimal. And that helped me kind of get perspective over this idea that the world hates you, right? If you understand how much God loves you, like the hatred and the, and the animosity of the world just seems so minuscule and insignificant uh, to that. So I just thought I'd share that with you. But that, that really kind of helped me kind of understand this perspective that as a follower of Jesus Christ, the world will hate you. And here's why, right? Because it hated Jesus, right? And, and why did it hate Jesus? I, I think at the heart of it is that a person committed to living a righteous life will always evoke animosity from someone practicing unrighteousness. This is John's point by, by highlighting the story of Cain and Abel. You know, it was Abel's righteousness in comparison to Cain's unrighteousness. He's bringing just his excess while, while, while Abel brought his very first and his best. And, and that contrast is what caused animosity between the brothers. And, and, and what's interesting in the text, if you read through the Genesis account, Abel doesn't say a word to his brother. It's not like he's condemning his brother or criticizing his brother. I mean, Abel doesn't say anything. It's just the action alone caused animosity and hate. It's a contrast. And that contrast, that, that, that revelation of a righteous life compared to an unrighteous life will always uh, cause animosity. Cain's response was that he got defensive. And that defensiveness led to hatred, and that hatred ultimately led to murder. Um, so what John is saying is that the world that is by nature... Uh, 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 by default, kind of children of the devil, right? Because we're not, if you're not in the kingdom of God, you're, not in the king, you're in the kingdom of darkness. There's no kind of, John's view of, of the world is very binary. You know, either you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. Either you, you are a child of God or you're not a child of God. Either you're walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. It, it's very clear. And so this is, John, this is what the point that John's making. And so John is saying, that as a Christian, you get, you get a sense some pushback, some animosity, some hatred from the world. And the question then for us, right, how do we respond, right? How do we as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, respond to that? Do we respond in kind? Do we meet their intolerance of Christians with the same kind of intolerance of their lifestyles or whatever it might be? Do, do we return hate for hate? Or do we respond differently? Um, do, do, we, do we respond with gentleness? Do we respond with kindness? Do we respond with love? Um, well, here's the bad news in this. As a Christian, you actually don't have an option, right? Uh, Jesus was really clear on this, right? This is what Jesus says in regard uh, to how we have to respond. He says, you have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor. In other words, love the people that love you. Love those that are next to you, your children, your family, your friends, the people who love you. Love those, but hate your enemy. That's, that's what the world says. But I say to you, Jesus says, that you are to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Like, come on. Like, that's crazy, right? Who does that? All right? Christians do that. All right? That's what makes us different. Right? And we don't do it in our own power because I can tell you right now, that's not something you get to just be able to dredge up out of your own soul. That has to be something outside of you, a love that is greater than you, that is flowing through you. And that's what Jesus' point is, that you love people the way God loves people. John will make that point here in just the beginning. Uh, and so John, John, John is going to talk about this quality of love that we ought to have in this world that sets us apart from the rest of the world. Um, and and so, so John's saying, like, and if you cannot love your brothers in the family of God, and your sisters in the family of God, how on earth are you, you going to possibly fulfill what Jesus is calling us to do here? To love our enemies, 
right? And to pray for those who persecute us. So, so that, the quality of love that we're called to as Christian has to begin in the household of God, right? It has to begin here. It has to begin within this community. This is where we practice the quality of love that God has called us to. And so John goes on, he says in verse 14, We know that we have passed out of death into life because, he loves the, because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And again, John is really kind of binary in his, in his view here. It's like love, life, hate, death. Like that, that's it. There's no gray, there's no shades of gray. Like either you're going to love people, which proves that you've actually passed from death into life, or, or you haven't. That's the way John views this. And so John is saying that, the, that love is the evidence that, that you do in fact belong to the family of God. And, and, and so he goes on. He says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And John is simply echoing what Jesus said in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Some of you who have read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, this is what, what, what Jesus says. He equates hatred with murder, just as he equates lust with adultery. Why? Because sin is a hard issue, right? You know, sin, doing things that displease God and dishonor people around us, is not simply wicked behaviors, right? It, it, it's a condition of heart. And, and so this is, this is why Jesus says, if you lust after a woman, you might as well commit adultery. If you hate your brother, you may as well murder him. Because it comes from the heart. And that's the issue that, 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 uh, that John is pressing us into here. So the question is not simply, what did you do? The question is, what would you do if you could get away with it? Right? Because you think about this. I mean, I know I thought, I thought about this. Oftentimes, the restraints on my life, you know, sometimes my actions, is because um, I'm afraid I'll get caught. I'm afraid of the consequences. Right? And that is not a great motivator, right? Because the issue is still like... I would do it if I could, right? That's a hard issue. And this is where John is pressing us, right? He is saying, um, you know, and so he goes on, verse 15, he says, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. That, that, and what he's saying, no one with hate in their heart has eternal life abiding in them. Now, what John is not saying is if you commit murder, you'll never experience eternal life because the gospel is really clear, right? That there is no sin. No sin that, that is too heinous, too deep, too far, that God's love cannot redeem you from. Except perhaps the sin of unrepentance, right? If you're just going to refuse to turn to God, right? And then you're left to your own devices. Uh, we, had a, we had an experience, uh, a number of, this was quite a while back. Um, Jess, Jessica and myself and a, and a bunch of people from Maui had an opportunity to go to Argentina. And, and during that time in the, uh, I think it was... You know, mid early early 200s, um, there, there was a there was a revival happening in Argentina that was pretty amazing. What God was doing in the nation at the time, and uh, we had an opportunity to go into Las Palmas prison. It is probably one of the most uh, it is a maximum security prison, um, and uh, it ha it houses some of the most like hardcore, like murderers, rapists, like these guys were just like hardcore criminals. Um, but God was doing such a work, particularly in the prisons in Argentina, that so many of these men were coming uh, to salvation in Jesus Christ. And their life, they were being born again. I mean, God was like changing them from the inside out. So much to, to the point, there was so much evidence of that, that the wardens actually began to create separate little Christian communities within the church, uh, within the prison. So we had an opportunity of going into one of these kind of separate uh, Christian prisons within Las Palmas Prison. And these inmates, they, uh, even though there's still bars and barbed wire around the thing, and they're in prison, there's uh, wardens and stuff, but um, they don't live in cells. They just live in open dorm rooms. And 24-7, all they're doing is praying and worshiping. And I can tell you, these men were, were still literally in chains. They were in barred. But I felt more freedom in that prison and more brotherly love that I've experienced out sometimes even in the community of, of church. I mean, it was amazing. The presence of God was tangible. Point is, God can redeem the worst of the worst, right? So Paul's not saying a murderer cannot experience eternal life. But if you harboring hatred in your heart, right, and you're allowing it to stew, and you're just sitting it in, and you're just kind of feeding it, right, it's evidence that eternal life is not dwelling in you. 
Because there's no way that the life of God can, can take up residency with hatred that looks to actually kill, harm, and destroy. And so those two things are contrary. And this is, what, this is, this is John's point, right? And, and so he's saying, you know, like if you're harboring hatred in your heart, um, then, then eternal life does not uh, exist in you. So, love your brothers, right? This is, this is the call of the Christian life, that we ought to love people in, in a, with a quality of love that is kind of outside of ourselves. Now, um, here's the thing about love. I don't know if you notice this. Like, I think love is probably one of the most misused and abused words uh, in our vocabulary, and certainly in our culture, right? Uh, we, we justify all kinds of things under the guise of love. We call our lust love. Uh, we manipulate, we control people with love. Uh, you know, love is probably one of the misused words, uh, you know, in, in the English vocabulary. Uh, and certainly in our culture today. Um, and, and so, how, what kind of love is, is John talking about? Like, what's the quality of love? Now, God is just... You know, he's wise. I mean, that's a kind of a weird thing to say, but it's true. He's, he's wise. And when God had the, the Bible written, the New Testament written, he chose a time and a place um, that the language of the land was very, very specific. Uh, the, the New Testament was written in, most of you who've been around church will know this, in Koine Greek, not in English, but in Greek. And the ancient Greeks were very specific about the words they used. And so in, in Greek, there are four words um, that describe love. In English, there's one, right? I love ice cream. I love my wife. It's, it's like the same thing. It means totally different things, right? But, but it's one word that I use for both of those things. Uh, but the Greeks were far more precise. And so, you know, you probably, you, maybe you've heard this before, but I'll give it to you anyway. So there were four words that the ancient Greeks used to describe love. The first was eros. Uh, like it sounds, it was erotic love or sexual love. That's, that's the first kind. The, the second kind was storge, um, which is family love. It was the love um, that shared between a parent and a child or between brothers and sisters. It was a family love. Uh, the third word for love was philea. Philea is where we get uh, Philadelphia. The city of brotherly love, is, is, that's kind of the root of that word. Um, and, and that's kind of, this talks about this, this, this deep abiding affection between friends. And this is possibly maybe the highest form of love humans can attain apart from God. Philea. There is another quality of love, a word that the, the Greeks would use for love, and it's called agape. And agape referred to godly love, a, God, a love that was beyond kind of the capacity of humanity, that was bestowed upon us by God himself. Agape love is a love that is unchanging. It's a, it's a love that is self-giving. It gives without demanding anything in return. It's a love that's so great that even when it is rejected or unrequited, it still continues to love. And this is the, the, the word for love that the writers of the New Testament use most frequently when describing the kind of love we ought to have for God, that God has for us, and we ought to have for the people that God places around us. That we're to have this unchanging, sacrificial, self-giving love for humanity around us. And so John continues, verse 16, by this we know love, right? By this we know agape, right? He says, if, you, if you're wondering what that looks like, okay, let me give you an example. This is how we know what that love looks like, that he, speaking of Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. So if you're asking the question, well, how do I love my brothers? John's saying, look to Jesus, right? Look to Jesus, right? And what did Jesus do? He loved us so sacrificially, so selflessly, that he was willing to lay down his life for us. Um, so... Christian love, this agape love, it's not just an expression of an emotion, right? It's not a warm and fuzzy feeling we're supposed to have for one another. It's, a word, it's not simply a verb. It is a noun. It's an action word. We ought to love with actions. You know, Jesus is our example. And, and how did Jesus love? He loved by laying down his life for us. Um, and so Jesus didn't simply talk about his love. But he actually proved his love by willfully sacrificing his love for us. And John says, this, by this we know, right? In a sense, what he is saying is that apart from Jesus' sacrificial love dying on a cross for us, we wouldn't even understand the quality of love that God has called us to. By this we know. You know, creation can teach us a lot of things about God. It can teach us about his majesty, about his power, about his intelligence, um, but creation cannot teach us about God's love. 
In order to teach us about his love, God demonstrated that by sending his son, Jesus Christ. That was the demonstration. In fact, Paul says exactly that to the church in Rome. He says, God shows, God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still rejecting him, while we still weren't paying a single moment of attention or, or responding to him in love, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And that's exactly what he did. So Jesus is the visible expression of God's agape love. And so how do we love as Christians? Um, John would say Christian love is demonstrated and evidenced, evidenced by a life of service and sacrifice. Because that's how Jesus loved, that we would lay down our lives for our brothers. Now, I don't know, when you think about laying down your life, you know, there have been seasons um, where, where, where Christians have, have called, been called to, to live, all of us have been called to live in the example of Jesus' life, but, but there have been seasons where, where Christians have actually followed Jesus in an example of death as well, where they've literally had to lay down their lives. Um, and I think oftentimes we think of laying down our lives in those dramatic, kind of heroic, kind of big moment kind of terms. Um, but I don't think this is exactly what John is pressing us into here. The truth is most of us, God will never ask us to literally lay down our lives in one dramatic, heroic event. But God will ask each of us, each and every day, little by little, moment by moment, to give of ourselves. Right? To give parts of ourselves away to people. Now, the scripture says that as Christians, we are living sacrifices. Right? That, that as we live, we ought to live in such a way that we are willing to give ourselves away, whatever that looks like for us, whether it's our time, our treasure, our talent, moment by moment, increment by increment, to give ourselves away in this life. Um, C.S. Lewis um, said something very insightful. He said this, It's easy to be enthusiastic about humanity with a capital H than it is to, sorry, than it is to love individual men and women, especially those who are uninteresting, exasperating, depraved, or otherwise unattractive. Right? It's easy to love, in other words, it's easy to love people um, th that are like us, you know, that love us. And it's easy to, to understand this concept of loving people kind of in the big, kind of big scheme of things, to love people. A lot harder to love individuals, right? Especially those that are hard to love. So he says this, I love this. He says, loving everyone in general may be the excuse for loving no one in particular, right? And so as Christians, we go like, yeah, we're supposed to love everyone, right? But, but that's not what John is saying. We need to love people particularly. We need to love people as individuals. That's how our love is expressed, right? And so uh, the love that God has called us to is not some big theological concept that we spread out across the world, right? It's very practical and it's very individual, right? Uh, and it will cost you something. It'll cost you something. You know, we're called to be living sacrifices. And, and the Apostle Paul says this is your, uh, your, your, your reasonable it's reasonable based on everything that Christ has accomplished for us, based on all that God has done for us. If you have partook in the, in the love of God, if you stand in the position of God as a child, if you are a beneficiary of the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then it is your reasonable, reasonable act of worship than to offer yourself as this kind of living sacrifice in love. And so John says in verse 17, but if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? He asks a question. And it's a question that has a very clear answer. It doesn't, right? God's love cannot possibly abide in you if you are indifferent to the needs of your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, so John is saying the, true te tr the test of a true Christian is the test of love. Because love acts, love demonstrates, right? You know, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's crazy. So John has raised up two things. He says, okay, firstly, don't hate your brother, right? And I think all of us are going like, yeah, we get that. We're not supposed to hate people. That, that, we can see how that's not good, right? But indifference, right? Indifference is far, far more insidious, right? And I think most of us at, at different seasons of our Christian walk, we are, are challenged with indifference, right? Uh, you know, indifference... Uh, you know, oftentimes in your Christian life, I don't know, I'll just speak of myself, in my Christian life, when Jesus first saved me, I was really passionate. I was like, man, I'm just going to charge it and just like love everyone and just whatever I can do, God. 
And then over time, you just kind of start getting comfortable, like in the Christian life, you know. And, and, and things just like, the passion starts to wane a little bit, right? And the zeal starts to kind of temper down. Um, and, and, and indifference, if we're not care, careful, can creep in, right? Indifference can creep in. You know, so what is indifference? You know, indifference is when you actually hear the, the voice of the Spirit of God telling you to do something, and because you're too preoccupied, because you're too busy, because life is just a little crazy right now, you just push it aside. You're like, okay, I'll get to it later, and then you never do it, right? Anyone? No, just me, right? Uh, you know, and so, so we do stuff like that all the time. Indifference creeps in, right? When you actually, when, when you're more focused on, on your pressing issues, because we all got issues, right? And things are happening. We're more focused on our issues that, that we're now indifferent to, to the needs of others around us. Because we just focused on, on our issues and our life. Because life's hard, right? It's easy to, to consume ourselves with our own problems. Um, that's indifference, right? Indifference can happen uh, when you convince... Um, you know, that, 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 that the things that the Spirit of God are, is trying to convict you in your life, things that you're doing wrong, and, and you just start kind of pushing that aside. And then over time, right, the cries of those in need just, just become quieter and quieter. The voice of the Spirit of God becomes quieter and quieter, and indifference seeps in, right? So hatred we get, right? Don't hate your brother. But man, we're all susceptible to indifference, right? And this is what John is pressing us down to, right? Um, you know, I, I love what uh, Peter Marshall writes. He says, a different world cannot be built by indifferent people, right? As Christians, we cannot be indifferent. If we want to see our, our community change, if we want to see truly the kingdom of God expand beyond the borders of this campus, out past Makawa, into kind of Waylo and, 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 and Hana and, and beyond, there, there are hundreds of thousands of people living on this island that, that, that are literally perishing apart from Christ. And we cannot be indifferent to that, right? We cannot be indifferent to that as a community of God. Um, and how do we serve them? We serve them with love, right? And serving with love, first, it begins by meeting the needs of people, right? You know, people don't really care much about the message until you're willing to show them that you actually love them by actually giving of yourself to them, whether it's through your, your treasure, your time, or your talent, right? So we cannot be indifferent. So how are we doing? Got kind of quiet in here. So let me encourage you, all right? So let, let me close with, with just a word of encouragement because John, that's exactly how John kind of closes out this chapter. Uh, John's going to give three great assurances for those of us who have been born again, for those of us who are Christians. He's going to say there are three things that you can count on, that you can take to the bank, right? If you are a Christian, if you've been born again, these, these three things are things that ought to give life to your soul. The first one is this, assurance of our right standing before God the Father. He says it this way. He says, by this we know that we are of the truth. We know this, that we're of the truth because the spirit of truth residing in us, living in us, indwelling us, is bearing witness to that and reassures our hearts before him, before God the Father. For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Now, this is an encouraging, encouraging passage of scripture, right? Because here's the thing, man. I jokingly tell people that, like, I'm a professional Christian. It's kind of true. I am. So I'm, prayed, I'm paid to be good, right? I mean, I'm paid to live a life that is kind of like, because I'm supposed to walk a life that is unworthy. But here's the thing. I blow it. I blow it, right? There's some people in my life that are difficult to love, that are difficult to love. And I sometimes say things and do things and think things that I know I should not do. And, and when I blow it, when I fail, right, my, my heart will condemn me. You know, there's a difference between conviction and condemnation, right? Do you guys know the difference? Conviction is of the Lord, right? The Lord is kind of like Sean, you know, you could be better. Come on, buddy. Come up here. Stop digging in the dirt. Come up over here. Live up. But, but condemnation is like you are, look at you. You call yourself a pastor. You this, and it kind of points a finger at you. And we actually have an enemy of our soul that's really good at that. You know, the scripture calls uh, Satan the accuser of the brethren, right? And so when I fail in, in, in rising to the standard of love that God has called me to, and I do, I do. There are times where I blow this. My, my heart will condemn me, and, and, and Satan will come in there and begin to accuse me. But what did John say? God is greater than my heart. God is greater than my heart. 
And so in those times when the enemy is accusing me, telling me that I'm a loser, you call yourself a pastor, you can't even love the people close to you, what kind of pastor do you think you are? He does that to me, right? When my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart. And in those moments, I just lean in to the truth of what God has said. I am a child of God. Look, behold, the love that the Father has lavished upon me so that I can become a child of God and this is who I am. I am loved. I am becoming. I'm not there yet, but I am becoming day by day more and more like Jesus, right? God is greater than my heart, right? And I love this, that that as Christians, we don't have to rely on our emotions, our feelings, but we can rely on the truth of who God is, right? God has promised to complete the work that he has begun, right, in all of our lives. So be encouraged, right? This is a hard word. Love your brothers like Jesus. Lay down your life for them. We blow it. Don't let the enemy condemn you in that. Keep rising up, right? Keep rising up. You you are, are becoming more and more. You're not there yet, but you are becoming. This is our goal. This is what we're shooting for. And when your heart condemns you, God is greater than your heart. You can be assured of your right standing as a child of God, as a son, as a daughter before your heavenly father, right? Second thing is this, that, that, that we can be assured that God hears our prayers. Um, he's, he's, John says it this way, Beloved, our heart does not condemn us. We have confidence uh, before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Here's the thing, man. When you delight in, in, in the love of God, you will conform your life to the will of God. When you love the Father, you'll be like willing and happy to please Him. You, you'll begin to align your heart with the, with the heart of God. You'll begin to align your life with the life of God. You'll be, begin to align um, your, your desires with the desires of God. And when your desires align with God's desires, the promise of Scripture is that God will answer your petitions, right? That you can go before your heavenly Father with great confidence, knowing that your life is surrendered to Him, your desires are surrendered to Him, and then lift up your petitions, knowing with confidence that God will answer your prayer. Now, sometimes God says no. Sometimes He says wait. And sometimes He says yes. But you can have great confidence that He hears your prayers, right? Uh, This should be great encouragement to all of us. And then thirdly, the assurance that God lives in us and we live in him. Verse 24 says this, Whoever keeps the commands abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us, right? So you can know because the spirit of God in you is going to testify that God is with you, not only with you, but he is in you and you are with him, right? I mean, this is the, the, the great encouragement of the Christian life. We're not left as orphans, right? We've been adopted, brought it into the family of God, and God himself will lead us and complete the work that he has begun in us. He has given us his spirit, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, to indwell us, to live within us, giving us the will and the desire and the power to do the things that please him. The spirit of God is in you, right? The spirit of God is in me. God is in us, and we are in him. And all of this, right, all of this is predicated on verse 24, sorry, 23, that says this. This is the commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and we love one another just as he commanded. I mean, you've got to love the clarity and simplicity of the Christian life, right? It's believe and love. There it is, right? Believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love people. Believe and love. Believe and love. You've got to love that clarity and simplicity, right? It's not easy, but it's clear, and it's simple, right? Believe and love. All right, we'll end there. All right, so um, I'm going to pray for us. Um, I'm going to invite Makota and the team back up, and uh, then we're going to just worship our way out of here. And what are we going to do? We're going to go love people because that's what God has called us to do. So Heavenly Father, I pray uh, right now that um, you would take this word, Um, And wherever it lands on the hearts of your people, Father, I pray that you would bring forth a a harvest of righteousness out of it, Lord. I pray uh, this week for each and every one of my friends that are called by your name, Father, they would have opportunities to love people in a way that truly reflects the love of God in this world. You would give them opportunities. I don't know what that would look like for each of us, uh, but, but they would be so clear to us that, that when that person's in front of us, you would, you would just remember this moment when I prayed for you to have an opportunity to love someone in the name of Jesus so that the love of God might be reflected through you. And Father, I pray that through that love, Father, the world might see 
that we truly are different. Not better, but different because of the way we love each other and because of the way we love the things that you love, the people that you love. And Lord, we need you in this, Lord. Apart from you, we can do nothing. We are desperate and needy, but you have promised to come. And so even now, Lord, I pray that you would come. Come fill us with your spirit. Come refresh us, renew us. Give us a vision of your great love for us. And out of that wellspring of your love, we would love people well for your glory and for our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, God, please bend our will, right, to be in alignment with yours. That every step we take would be <laughs> in your will. We stand with us as we make a joyful noise to the Lord and worship our way out of here. Hey, come on, my cakey. Hello, my, hello, my. I'm expecting the moves now. You're going to sit in the front row. You got to stand up. Now show me your moves. to be a part of God. I pray that we would go and be a blessing. <laughs> and um, if you need prayer, please, there are prayer warriors up here to pray for you. <laughs> so don't leave without that. Um, we will see you. We look forward to seeing you next week, if not sooner. So have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Happy Veterans Day, guys.